and welcome to chapter 11. Hopefully chapter 10's chapter on inheritance wasn't too uh, overwhelming for you and you're ready to get into some more inheritance concepts. Chapter 11 covers some more advanced concepts that go along with inheritance. We're going to cover abstract, dynamic binding, um, interfaces, and we'll finally get into a description of packages, kind of like those things from your uh, midterm, and hopefully we'll help you to understand them a little bit better. Let's get started. Okay, abstract classes. Abstract classes are what you would use when your class is so generalized that you never actually use it alone. In the example that we're going to give you today, we're going to talk about an animal. Well, generally when you refer to an animal, you don't refer to a animal you refer to a specific type of animal, a dog, a cat, a bird, a snake, a fish. These are specific types of animals, but we really rarely talk about an animal as just the concept of an animal. But it's kind of useful to have an animal class because in, in the case that we're going to use, we're going to have an animal and he has a name and he has the ability to speak, so whatever his, his speaking term is. And so we're going to create this animal class. Now, obviously, in the real world, you would have a lot more data variable or data fields in this than just name and speak, but we're just going to start with the two basics. So we sometimes call these virtual classes because we don't actually ever instantiate an animal. You could, but because we don't think that we're going to, we're going to make it abstract. An abstract class does not ever get instantiated. You never make a new animal. You're always going to make a class that extends or inherits an animal. So we have created two different classes, subclasses, of our parent class animal. One is a dog and one is a cow. The dog says woof and the cow says moo. So we have the speak method on our abstract class and that speak method is going to be created in our subclasses directly. We're not actually going to write a speak class for an animal because at the time we write an animal, we don't have a clue how it speaks. We don't know what its little term is going to be for speaking. Is it going to be meow? Is it going to be a little chirp chirp for a bird or a slither for a snake? So lots of different things that we can do with this. By being able to make an abstract class of an animal though, we can ensure that all of the animals underneath it not only have a name, but they also have the ability to speak. So they have the method speak because we're going to require that those classes create a speak. Okay, so you can see in our get name and our set name for our animal class, we have set our setters and our getters for name, but we did nothing for speak. Over in our classes for our dog and our cow, you can see that we did override the speak method. So our, do our dog can say woof and our cow can say moo. The way we do this is we created that method over at speak and we put the word abstract before the return value. And this tells it, I'm not going to create getters and setters for it. I'm not going to create anything for it inside my animal, but I am going to make sure that they get implemented in my subclasses. So non-abstract methods like our get name and our set name, those are just done like normal. You know how to do those already. And then our abstract methods are going to be completely empty but they're expected to be created by our child class. Over on your right hand side, you can see how we used our animals by doing my dog, my cow, my snake. And for my dog, I'm going to do um, my dog Murphy and my cow, her name is, is Elise or Elsie. And I have a snake and his name is my snake Sammy. We're going to assume by the way that we've also created a snake class. In the book there is one, which is where we got this from. And then for each of those, I can say my dog says whatever the dog speak term is. Okay? So this is kind of teaching you the concept of an abstract class. We are going to be doing abstract classes in the homework, so I hope this makes sense to you. Remember, an abstract class is so generalized, you don't instantiate it directly. You only instantiate subclasses of it. However, by making them all animals, we can now do an array of animals and add them all inside of it. Let's move on to the next one. Now we're going to talk about a concept called dynamic method binding. When you create an abstract class, like our animal, 
you have to use one of the subclasses to declare it. We've covered that concept. So the abstract class, you don't ever reference an animal directly. However, you can create an object reference to an abstract class. So in our case, we have our animal. So our animal is animal reference. And that's fine. You can definitely declare that as the type. And then when you create the object, when you instantiate it to a value, at that point, so we have our animal reference equals new cow, at that point, you actually are setting your animal reference to a cow as opposed to just a generic animal. This is called dynamic binding or late binding because what happens is the variable animal reference doesn't know it's a cow until you tell it that it's a cow. As you can see, three lines later, we create a new dog and we set animal reference equal to the dog and then run the speak command on that as well. So in this case, you're seeing that the animal reference can be set to any of the subclasses at any point, late binding dynamically. So they don't get done at compile time, they get done at run time. So when it's actually run and when it's actually created is when the association or the typing of that object actually gets confirmed as whatever type you create it. There is a concept of fixed binding, which is done when you use the this reference. It's, it's bound and attached when the code is compiled. So you don't have to worry about that changing as it goes on. Those are static references or using fixed binding. It doesn't change later on. You can also use your abstract parent as parameters in your class. So while you are writing your methods, I could say, I'm going to make a method called talking animal and it's going to take an animal. And I can pass in dogs and cats and birds and snakes into this because they're all a type of animal. So one of the great things about abstract classes is that we can easily just use them throughout and the code will figure out because my subclasses are of type animal that they'll work just fine. So that's dynamic method binding. Let's move on. As I alluded to in the last slide, we can create arrays of subclass objects. So same way that we did our animal reference and we changed it from a cow to a dog, we can create an array of animals which we can then put in dogs and cows and snakes and birds, all the different types of animals that we want in there into a single array. Remember when we talked about arrays, they needed to have the same type. Well, in this case, they do. They are all animals. Even though they're different types of animals, what is your pet? I have three pets and they're dogs and cats and birds. You can put all of my pets into one array called my pets and they're all animals. It makes things kind of convenient. So each array element can be a different type of child class and that's fine. You can do your dogs and cats because they're all base classes as their parent, which in this case is an animal. So you can see in the example here, we were able to create an animal reference array that it referenced multiple animals. And we added our dog and our cow and our snake. And then we were able to run through our for loop with our animals where each of them was able to call the speak method, which they all had to have because they were all animals. And it worked just fine. So that is creating arrays of subclass objects, which is one of the great things about inheritance is it gives you that option. We've mentioned the object class before, but kind of in passing in a generic sense. The object class is the Java class that we use that all references are a part of. Everything inherits the object class. It's just kind of the, the default parent of all of the objects that you've been creating. The fun thing with an object class is that there's a few methods that we can use on any object. And you've used them before. We've used the equals, definitely. Um, you may not directly use the toString, but we can use the toString as well. There's also the concept of a clone, which is great because it creates a copy. But think of it as all of these, ref these methods, equals, toString, and clone, can all be overridden um, or overloaded so that when you have your object, your salesperson, your dog, your animal, you can write an overloaded method for equals that will compare the values that are in your object directly. Then you can just take two values and say, are they equal? And instead of saying, are they the same reference, using equal, equal, obviously that's not going to work. Overloading the equals method allows you to do really easy comparisons between two objects to make sure that those two objects are in fact equal. 
if we wanted to make sure that we didn't create another salesman with the same ID number or something like that, we could look at it and say, hey, are these two values the same? Are they equal? And we could have that in our equal method that we can overload. Important things to keep track of. The, over, the, the overloading for the equals, it only works if they are the same reference type. So if it's a dog and a cow, it's not going to work. But if it's a dog and a dog, it is. So they have to be the same reference. If we do um, the two string, anything that we do that tries to print out what our object is, is going to use that two string. I've been having you guys use display just because I want you to get used to the idea of this is what's being displayed. But you can always overload the two string method so that you can just say print, you know, system out, print line, salesperson. And it'll go find your two string method and run that run directly. Same way you can do it with an integer or float or string. It's kind of convenient that way. That way you don't have to call the method display. Anything that is designed to use the two string method will be able to use that. So you can see here, we've got a couple of, of examples on the screen that just show you that your class animal extends object, everything extends object. You don't need to say the extends object, it has to, everything does. Um, and we've overloaded our equals method here with a bank account, and we've um, given you some examples of the two string overriding method so that we can call my dog dot two string and get it to print out my dog, which is great. So hopefully they give you a couple of things on the object class that you can use. And please remember to ask questions if that didn't make sense. A couple of notes on good software design. It's really important that you start making habits now on the best ways to design your code, to use good software design. Don't use an array when a string will work. Don't use an array list if you could use an array. Don't use a string when you need to use a boolean. Lots of good software designs. Try to syntax, get rid of all your syntax errors before you try to run your code. One of the main things when it comes to inheritance to talk about with good software design, the purpose of inheritance is to make sure that you do not reinvent the wheel, that you don't copy and paste code into three different classes because they essentially all do the same thing with a couple of little differences. When we think of good software design, you want to think of things in terms of how is this going to save me time, complexity, and code. I don't want to write the same code multiple times. If I write it in three different places, I have to check it in three different places. I have to make sure that if I update one of those three, that the other two have to get updated as well. The point of this is not doing to code duplication, not reinventing your wheel. One of the reasons why subclasses and inheritance works and it helps is because the code in the superclass is already written and tested and compiled. That piece of code works. We know it works. We compiled it. And anytime that you add a new subclass, you know that the other subclasses and your superclass still compile and still run. Now, if you do need to go in and change your superclass, that's fine. Just make sure that your subclasses all still work with it as well. You've probably already coded some of the different test cases when you're building your superclass. You've already thought about what kind of methods am I going to need? What kind of, of objects am I going to use? You've thought about a lot of the code that you're going to need when you write your superclass. In fact, the great thing about inheritance is it means a huge amount of that code is written. You don't have to write it again. It's already done for you. And you've already thought about how am I going to print out my object or how am I going to do my, my constructor? So a lot of code has already been written for you by the time you get to the point of adding in your subclasses. So in the case of the animal where I had a dog and a cat and a bird and a cow and a snake, um, I don't want to have to rewrite my getters and my setters for my name. I don't want to rewrite my constructors. I don't want to have to rewrite all of my data fields. I've already got all that done. By, by doing a super class that does a lot of that for us, my subclass code should be very simple, depending on how you've thought about it. And this is where it comes down to stop and think about how you're going to code before you start coding. You want to sit there and think about 
How are these objects similar? How are they different? What are the differences? What are the similarities? How can I reuse some code? And what code can I just not? If I have a dog and a cat, and they both have four legs, and they can both walk as opposed to a bird, which can walk and fly, but dogs and cats can't fly. So you start thinking about what is the difference between my subclasses? How can I take some of this code and reuse it in my superclass? And how can I use it in my subclasses? When we think about animals, think of how in biology, animals are subclassed. You have all animals. Then you can subclass into insects or mammals or amphibians because all amphibians share some traits that mammals don't share. So you can think of it that way, as you can subclass the same way that we do in biology or the same thing we do in a lot of things that we do to subclass things. So good software design. If you're reinventing the wheel, if you're rewriting the same code in multiple locations, you're probably doing it wrong because the goal of inheritance is not to do that. That being said, you can't use inheritance in everything. It's not like the end all be all that solves all your problems. It is a tool in your toolbox that you can use when it's appropriate. Don't use it if it's not appropriate. Let's move on. So when it comes to inheritance, Java does not allow multiple inheritance. You cannot inherit from two different parent classes. It just won't let you do it. So if you have an inheritance, you only get one parent. However, there are a concept called interfaces, which is an alternative to multiple inheritance. You can have multiple inheritance uh, in interfaces inherited. Instead of using the keyword extends, we use the keyword implements. And the keyword implements only works within interfaces. It does not work with parent classes. So let me explain how an interface works. With an interface, all the methods are public and abstract. Remember, an abstract method is one that you don't write any code for. You just declare the header. So you have your public, static, abstract, final, those type of things. You have your return value. You have your parameters. But you don't have any code. So you have to actually write the code when you implement it. Also, all data items are public, static, and final. They don't change. You don't use these for data items that are that are unique to each of your class objects. So if I had my salesperson class, I would not be inner I would not use an interface for that because I want to be able to have different values for each of the IDs and each of the sales amounts. However, if I did have some final details like the number of cards in my deck or the name of my company, those can be static and final, and they're not going to give you a problem. So you can see below, we have a couple of pizza constants. These are constants for our pizza place. What is the diameter of a small versus a large? What's the tax rate? What's my company name? These are things that you can put into an interface to allow you to reference those constants without having to rewrite in all of your different code. The other thing is when you implement an interface, you're going to be writing all of the code and it must have all of the methods that are required by the interface. So if I have an interface that says you have to implement a to speak method or a display method or a when I click this button method, you have to go implement it. You have to make sure that you include that method in your code. So the nice thing about an interface is that it gives you kind of a spec that you have to follow when you write your code. It ensures that all the programmers after it who want to use that interface are going to write that code and they're going to include those methods in their code. You can also use an interface to store your related constants like we are doing here with our pizza constants. It's great being able to reference those constants from another file because that file no longer becomes part of my code that might get screwed up or might have a mistake in it. It's all good. It's compiled and it's sitting over on the side and I know I can use it anytime I want. So it's kind of nice to store your constants, especially if there's more than a few, in a separate file called constants something. And you can use it there. These are interfaces. You are going to be implementing an interface in your code for your um, homework. So make sure you understand that part of it. 
So we've introduced you to both abstract classes and interfaces, and you may be sitting there wondering, what's the difference? Why would I pick one over the other? So yes, they are similar in that you cannot instantiate concrete objects from either one. You don't make a abstract class object and you don't make an interface object. You have to reference the subclass of both. The way that they differ is that abstract classes can contain non-abstract methods, whereas interfaces are all abstract. So in your abstract class, you can create a couple of methods in there that are not abstract methods. You can actually build them inside the abstract class. So if I had a print or a display or some other method that I had all the, all the, the values that I needed at this point, nothing was going to change, and I wanted this method available to all of my subclasses, and I wanted to write it at this point. You can write it in your super class, in your super abstract class. You can write the code there. Interfaces don't have any code in them. Interfaces are kind of just a blueprint or a spec that give you a description of these are all my data fields, these are all my methods that I'm going to be implementing. But you don't actually write any code at that point. If you are the type of programmer that really likes to use blueprinting or methods that in your design that say, I'm going to make a method to do this, I'm going to make a method to do that, a method to do this, sometimes interfaces are going to be something you're going to like because you start by just saying, these are all the methods I know I'm going to implement. And then when you implement them, you can implement each one in your subclass directly. And your code will yell at you if you forgot one, if you forgot to enter in a method that you were supposed to enter. And it's going to kind of keep track of you. Another thing to remember, classes can only inherit one superclass. This is the um, extends, the inheritance directly. But it can implement any number of interfaces. You can have multiple interfaces for a single subclass, and that's fine. You can just only have one superclass. So if you have an abstract class that you want to be the parent class or superclass of your object, you can only have one, whereas you could have multiple interfaces and implement all of them. So hopefully that kind of explains a little bit between abstract classes and interfaces. So we created packages with our midterm, with our midterm package, but we didn't really spend a lot of time going over it. So I do want to go back and hit this concept, make sure that you understand how packages work. When you have multiple files that all have the same theme, they're all in the same topic, they're all going together, and you want to keep these files kind of combined together, you can put them into a package. If you don't name the package, it'll be created with default package depending on the emulator that you use. Um, I would recommend naming your packages just because it makes more sense. You can build your package, compile it, and then use it in your code. You've actually been referencing them all along. The Java utility package, the Java swing package. These are packages that the users of Java, the creators of Java, have gone through and built packages with large amounts of classes and code and methods so that you can reference those. The nice thing about it is that if you want to create a package that you want to use multiple times, you don't always have to include all of the code in every file that you use, but you might want to use some of the methods from that code. So you can create a package the same way that Java created the utility package and pull the scanner out of it or to pull some math operations out of it that you want. The general naming convention for packages is what I call backwards compared to what we normally think of. It, in, if a package is located at c.com.course.animal.dog or slash job, dog dot java. So instead of it being the, the most important, the name of the class first, we put the name of the class last and then any of the other packages or locations in your file folder. Um, would be the way to describe it. So in this case, we would call it com.course.animals and then dot capital D-O-G, because that's the name of the class. The same way that we do with java.utility.scanner, java.swing.joptionpane. So we think of it as kind of going backwards in terms of what subject we're talking about. 
So all of the commercial and then inside of that, all of my courses, then inside of that, all of the animals, and then inside of that is the dog. So you think of it as backwards. The thing about custom packages though, is you can't use your wildcard with your custom packages. This is the way that we do java.utility.star. If you have three classes you wanna import from Java Utility, you can just use the star, the wildcard. We can't do that with custom packages. You have to reference each class individually. So you would say, you know, my course dot salesman, my course dot horse, my do course dot card, my course dot deck. So however you decide to do that in your package. If we did our midterm, it would be midterm dot card or midterm dot deck, midterm dot class types. These were things that you would include in a package called midterm. Okay, so hopefully that kind of cleans up a little bit of how to use packages. Again, so far in this class, we haven't really needed them because the amount of code that you're sending me does not need to be in a package. However, there may come a time that we start doing that in a couple more lessons. So those are packages. That covers most of the concepts in chapter 11. A couple of things to remember. Your abstract methods do not have a body. There is no code in your abstract methods. It's just the method header with no body. So you have to make sure you remember if you make an abstract method and you try to put some code in it, it's going to get kind of cranky with you. When you write your abstract methods, you do end them with a semicolon because you're essentially telling the, computer, the compiler this is going to be a method in the future, so it's more of a statement rather than a method. So you do need a semicolon at the end. You can override your abstract methods in your subclasses. But don't use overload when you mean override. Two different types of methods. Override is the exact same parameters written in a different class. So you can override, but it's the same parameters, exactly. Overload means that it's different parameters. When we overloaded our constructors with different parameters, overloaded methods have different parameters to tell the compiler which method to use. Override means use the method that is created in the, in the class that I'm working with. So if you have a subclass, use these methods in my subclass, not the ones from my superclass. Abstract classes cannot be instantiated. Can't make an object called an animal because there's no um, instantiation of abstract classes. And if you do use your packages, you cannot use wildcards with your custom packages. Now, if starting from now, now that we've actually talked about packages in a class, you decide to start putting your exercises into packages, that's fine. Send me the whole package. Like send me like the package directory or send me as send me, um, and let me know that you've used a package because when I'm testing your code, I'm going to need to package it, um, which is fine. I just need to know that. So um, if you're going to be using packages, just tell me I packaged my code. These are the package names I used. Okay, let's move on to your homework. All right, so I decided you guys have had a kind of rough couple of weeks. I've been throwing a lot of work at you. Instead of three exercises, I'm only giving you two. They're two hard ones, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, so exercise one is your easy class, easy exercise. Easy in the sense of it's easier than the other one. Um, you're going to create an abstract class called a book, and it's an abstract class, so remember what that means. You're going to have a title and a price. You're going to have a constructor. Abstract classes can have constructors, um, and the constructor is going to take a string. It is not going to take a price. You are going to add setter or getters for the title and the price, and then you're going to have an abstract method for your set price. The set price is going to be something that you're going to do with your subclasses. So over in your subclasses, you're building two subclasses. One is fiction and one is nonfiction. The fiction has its price and the nonfiction has its price. And you're going to implement the set price method for each subclass. So you're going to set them with those amounts. You're also going to cre can create a constructor for the subclass that uses the set price method. So you're going to have your set price method, you're going to implement it, and you're going to use that inside of your constructor for your subclass. Last, you're going to make your test file called use book, and it's going to demonstrate it. Go ahead and fill it out with some data to start with. You don't have to do a user defined anything for this one. You don't have to have a while loop with a sentinel. I think you guys have done that enough. I want you to go ahead and instantiate a couple of, of books, I don't know, five or six, maybe at least two of each class. Um, make sure that you that you show me that your subclasses and methods work okay so that's exercise one 
Your second exercise is exercise 13. Please don't let the amount of stuff on the screen scare you. There is a lot to this one, but again, only giving you two exercises this week. You're going to build an app for the loan company to keep track of their construction loans. You're going to calculate the total amount owed on the due date, which is their loan amount plus the loan fee. All of this is in the book. So if you're going to need some help doing the math, let me know, but essentially you should be fine from the book. Your loan class is abstract. It's going to implement the loan constants interface. So you're going to use an interface class for your loan constants. You're going to hold a couple of constant information. Um, and then you're going to implement that on your loan class. You're going to include your loan number, your last name, the amount of the loan, and the term of the loan, which are all provided by the user. The other piece of information is the interest rate, which is going to be determined by your subclass. Okay, so that's going to be whether it's a business loan or personal loan. None of your loans can be over $100,000. So we're going to have that as a, as a rule. So you're going to have to have some sort of constant somewhere that's going to hold on to that piece of information so you can deal with it. And the default loan for your constructor is a short-term loan, which is one year. Okay. Loan constants class has a couple of information. That's going to be your interface. Don't forget the interface gets implemented. You implement an interface. Then we have two subclasses. We have our business loans and our personal loans. The subclass will extend your loan and it will assign a interest rate, which is going to be 1% more than prime. Prime is a percentage rate. So 4.3 would be 4.3%. When you do your application, create loans, you are going to create an array of about five loans. You're going to prompt the user, what is the current prime rate? And the user is going to enter 2.3%. I don't know what the prime rate is right now. Then you're going to prompt for what is the loan type and what is the other relevant information, the last name, the amount, so on and so forth. And then based on the information, you are going to determine the appropriate loan object and store that in an array. After the user has entered everything, you're going to display all of the loan information. This is one where I'm actually going to grade you on this part. Use your space wisely. Remember, when we're printing out to a terminal, there's only 10, 15 lines total that you can do. Um, and that's including your prompts and all of that information. I want to be able to see all of your loan info on one screen without having to scroll. So please do not print out each loan using up five spaces or five lines. I'll get cranky because then I have to scroll through to find out what the information is. Okay? All of this information is in the textbook with a little bit more. So if you get confused, go back to the textbook. The textbook's there for a reason. Read the textbook. Make sure you follow the textbook rules. Don't come back and say, but in the, in the, the video you said short term was one year. What does it say in the book? Go by the book. It's okay. That's what the book's for. That's why you bought it. Okay? Abstract class, interface class, abstract methods. We're doing a lot here. Okay? So hopefully this gives you a, a pretty good rundown of the concepts that are in Chapter 11. Hopefully you have fun. This is definitely a, a, a bigger project, but you can do it. Not as big as your midterm. Anyway, have fun. Uh, call me if you need help, and I will talk to you soon.